morning, everyone. It's a beautiful morning here in North Dakota. All right, we have, uh, looks like there's four people here on the live stream. We'll get going here in a few minutes. Um, I'm just enjoying a cup of coffee out here on the deck before we walk through the gardens and the vineyards. How's everyone doing there? Is it working? Is um, it showing up? Just a second, let me check here. <laughs> just checking to make sure all the technology works. I see you. Oh, good. You're there. Hold on. What? Is it live? It should be live. Are, are you we live? Are we live? Are you seeing it live? Uh, a little live. A little live. There's a little lag. Well, of course there's a little lag. So you don't do anything stupid. No. Yep, I can see you. Excellent. Well, today I want to uh, talk, I want to show you the vineyards and the gardens and the vegetable gardens. Obviously, as a plant-based eater and uh, someone who cooks with lots of plants, I have to grow plants because I need to eat. So... Um, I don't know how many of you out there also like to garden. Um, I think there might be a few more pe people joining us in a minute. So, um, I don't see any the comments. My, hmm? I don't see the comments. Up in the upper right. Oh, is there, there we go. Is okay, there a comment yep, stream? I found it. Yeah, because I don't see any comments on the phone right now. But All right, I'll try to watch comments for you. Good. Kiba is here. Who is there? Kiba. Oh, good. Everybody say hi to my wife, Lisa. You might have seen her in some of my videos earlier. Or I'm not. Tr I'm trying to get her into more videos, but... It's early. It is early. Mm -hmm. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, who wants to see... I'm trying to figure out where we should start. So, um, I think... Uh, I have a 12-acre farmstead here. Uh, a lot of it is natural prairie and old pasture lands, but I have um, a vineyard, small vineyard over here on the right, because this is part of a working winery. And uh, two vegetable garden plots, one in an old horse bin pasture, and then one out back by actually the beautiful neighbor's wheat field. So um, maybe we can uh, get up and walk around as soon as I finish my coffee. Need coffee in the morning, you right? You might need more. I might need more, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm, I'm, I have my um, camera on a tripod, and I'm going to carry it around with me, and hopefully it doesn't shake too much. So I do apologize if the video quality is not so good. But the birds are chirping. It's a beautiful morning, and I don't know if you can see behind me there. We have uh, really nice views out here in the country, and the sun is shining right on my face. Or coffee. No. Okay, okay so... I'm going to take you down. I think first we'll be walk through the vineyard. So one of the things we do here is grow grapes for wine. And it's a real challenge to grow grapes in a very cold climate. So we grow grapes that are cold climate grapes. And most of these grape varieties are developed in Minnesota. A lot of them at the University of Minnesota and some from some private breeders. And I'm going to flip my camera around here so you just see where we're headed. So here is a vineyard and I'll walk through it to give you a little bit of the lay of the land. I have a barn and lots of sunshine I see and the decks where I was just sitting. So I have about 80 vines planted here. Uh, as I said, this is a, a cold climate grape. Uh, the variety is called Frontenac, and this year I'm very happy because these are just loaded with grapes this year. They're still green. They should ripen up sometime in September. And we're gonna have, um, I don't know, I'm hoping to get at least a thousand pounds of grapes from these 80 vines. This is a, a grape variety which can really be cropped pretty heavily because it's a really vigorous vine. And I don't know if anyone knows anything about, oh, so Whisper, yeah, we are located in Mapleton, North Dakota, about 20 miles west of Fargo. There's the fields, lots of agriculture around here. Give you another little vantage view of my vineyard here. 
I'm hoping the light adjusts okay. For our winery, we do purchase grapes from um, other local growers and we're passionate about using only grape varieties which grow here in this region. So, if you have any questions about grape growing or wine making, I think I can answer those too. Um, I don't know how many people are interested in fermentation or wine. Um, I was thinking about adding some of that to our uh, video lines up. Would you like me to talk a little bit more about wines? Because I've been focused mostly on cooking. Yeah, this is my happy place. It's just lovely to come out here and, and walk in the morning. Here, let me... You can see me walking through it too. So yeah, um, these vines take a little bit of work. We have to tend them, we have to prune them, make sure they don't uh, grow too much. And here in North Dakota, of course, our grapes really suffer. So I guess that makes for a good wine as well. Okay, I'm coming out the other end of the vineyard. So uh, what you can see here, on our property, we have a waterway out there, but it's been really dry this year. And so the water uh, dried up, but uh, we have about five acres that we have had the whole area tilled up and reseeded with natural prairie grasses and flowers to try to reestablish the natural prairies that have been gone from the region for more than a hundred years. So that is the vineyard that I have here on the property. One of the vineyards, the first vineyard we planted was in a spot where the soil was really bad. So the grapes really didn't grow there and that we call it our experimental vineyard, but really it's a failed vineyard. Okay, so we'll just head over here. I can show you more as we go. Um, this barn is a uh, a classic barn. I don't remember the name of the style of the barn. Anybody who does farming know? Um, the barn was built, we think, sometime in the 1940s, but we're not quite sure the original history of the barn. It's certainly one of the last of this kind of, of barns that was there. Hip roof barn, maybe. Next to the barn, the previous owners had, oh, I left my, my watering lines out for you. Um, the previous owners had horses here, and so this used to be a horse pasture. Of course, the soil is very fertile. Show the whole barn. Okay. We can show the whole barn if I can back up here. Now, it's had a tin roof put on probably about 25 years ago. It had an original wood shake roof and a cupola on top, but... Uh, and that's been gone for a while, but that um, tin roof has saved that barn from deterioration. It's in pretty good shape, other than needing to be painted and a few windows fixed up here, it is uh, in good shape. So uh, in my, my grapes, we produce about, it's a very small production from my vineyard, about 25 to 50 cases or so from that vineyard, uh, but we produce about, anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 cases a year of wine. Okay, so this is a vegetable garden. Uh, vegetable garden number one. And I can show you some of those vegetables. So it's been really hard this year. You can see I've done a little bit of watering, but it's been really hard this year because it's been so dry. You can see the soil is uh, basically powder. We're supposed to get some rain tonight finally for the first time in, oh gosh, uh, weeks and weeks. Uh, but I've been trying to keep the plants watered every day so that they will grow and it's been hard to establish them. Especially, I usually have lots of kales and lettuces and things like that growing this year, but um, it's been hard to get those seeds to germinate and stay alive because I will water it and then it'll bake in the sun and the soil will get hard and it will strangle those seedlings. But most of the other things I planted have growing well. So I can tell you a little bit about, oh, hello DC. 
um, some of the other things I have planted here besides the cat rolling in the dirt. Um, lots of peppers. I love peppers. So here we're growing um, both hot peppers and sweet peppers. I have serranos and jalapenos as well as uh, some banana peppers, some Anaheim peppers. We have uh, what other kind of peppers? Some some sweet bell peppers, and they're growing well. These were planted from plants. Um, I think they're going to start to flower pretty soon and start producing some peppers because they're really starting to take off. And if anyone want to come and help pull some weeds, I'd be very happy. These are tomatillos. I love green salsa, so I have uh, lots of tomatillos, and I I actually uh, just pop those in the freezer and have them all winter long so I can save them easily to make green salsa all year. So my tomatillo plants, um, here are my tomato plants. Tomatoes are really starting to grow well. I think my tomato cages are a little bit too small. Uh, actually I have what? I have one, two, three, four, five, six tomatoes, six plants, planting and salsa from plum tomatoes. And we're starting to see some tomatoes growing here. I also have a variety called Cheyenne. I think that's a, a local variety. Uh, celebrity tomatoes because they just produce well. And uh, what else do I have? Julie, it's not really a cherry tomato. It's more like a, uh, what do you call it? Well, there's one right there. This variety, Juliet, produces the best uh, small tomatoes. Unlike the round cherry tomatoes, these do not crack and, and uh, open up like the other one, like the round ones do. These are sweet and delicious and really, really grow well. Very prolific. My peas this year have been very slow. As a matter of fact, they're still small. Um, so I haven't had any peas. I usually get them early on in the season, but um, nothing yet. But they're, they're looking pretty good. Here are my cucumbers. I have two varieties of cucumbers. One is called Market More. It's a nice like pickle type of cucumber. The other is an Asian cucumber, uh, which I love for the texture and the flavor. They're my favorite and they're starting to flower. So it won't be long before this trellis is completely filled and the, t the cucumbers are growing off the top. Cucumbers. Um, I actually save my seeds every year too. So I don't buy new cucumber seeds. I just save them from the previous year and replant them. And another vegetable I just love, and I'll be doing some recipes on these, are eggplants. So I have a lot of eggplants. Uh, I have Black Beauty eggplants, so the large Italian varieties. And I have uh, two different kinds of Asian eggplants. One is called, I think, Millennium. And the other is, I like them because they're sort of long and uh, narrow and they hold up their texture really well. They don't get very mushy when you cook them. And so they're great for stir fries and things like that. What I have been picking so far are radishes and the radishes are really growing pretty well. I don't know if I can zoom this in. I can't, can't zoom the camera in. Uh, radishes, so I have uh, um, French breakfast radishes, which are nice and mild and delicious, and then a, a round red radish. And I also grow the Korean daikon radish, the Korean radish, which is um, not as long as a Japanese daikon, but it is, um, I think, tastier, uh, a little bit shorter and fatter, if you will. But uh, I, as a matter of fact, I just recorded a recipe, which I'm going to be editing after my yogurt recipe. I think I'm going to do my, my Korean radish salad recipe and beets. I have both golden beets here and they're just starting to grow up pretty big, big and red beets. This in the garden, again, this year it's been kind of dry and hard to get something started. So I actually don't have as much planted as I usually do back here. Okay, am I back? Sorry, I think there's some internet connections because I just went from the house Wi-Fi now to my cell. Excellent. Anyway, I was talking about these beans.
I have a small yellow bean that, that grows uh, up on a pole. I have a flat, sort of a wax yellow bean that's in a And I also grow the beans. So these are the yard long beans. And again, I just save the seeds every year and replant them. No need to buy them once you have them growing once. Now, another interesting plant, if uh, anyone has ever seen um, beans growing, of course, as a plant-based eater, one of the most common beans that we consume are chickpeas, okay? And I decided to take my bag of chickpeas that I had, or I think they were grown in Canada, and I threw them in the ground. And guess what? They're growing. And I didn't realize that the chickpea plant looks quite different than most other beans. So take a look at this. That's a chickpea plant. Garbanzo beans. And so I have a whole row of garbanzo beans and I'm looking forward to see if they'll actually produce here because if they will, I'll be growing my own garbanzo beans here. This is another, this is a, uh, so I keep growing those every year. One of my favorite is a bean from El Salvador. It's a red bean called uh, Frijo Rojo. It means satin. Again, beans that I just took out of a package that a friend of mine from El Salvador gave me. And I planted them and they grew. And so every year I grow these red beans. They're small little red beans and plant them. And they have the texture of satin, which is why they're called satin beans. Frijol Rojo de Seda. And also this year I'm growing a row of, of Pintone. Okay, so that's the beans. I have this space off. Okay, I'm back. I know, sorry about that. Uh, summer squashes, I have a yellow zucchini, I think, both kind of green zucchini, and one is the um, the Romanesco, Costa Romanesco variety, which has the ribs on them, which has a good texture. And oh, I see some coming right there. So it won't be long before I'll be eating zucchinis. And a uh, patty pan squash. Now, I love pat... <coughs> I know I'm cutting in and out, sorry. I'm just gonna walk back here. I got a duck under the fence here. All right. Okay, as we uh, head out towards the east side of the property, there's that filled vineyard. There's a few vines growing, but we have 300 grapevines in there that just didn't survive. So there's something the soil, I think, has too much clay in it. But these are the vistas we see from our place. Next to us, they're growing wheat, and it's just about to start turning brown. So we'll have these golden fields of wheat here pretty soon. But here's my back garden. I have a a tank over here I fill with water so that I can come and water when I need to water. This year I've been watering a lot. <clears throat> yeah, weed? No, I wish. No, uh, that, that is wheat. Okay, here's my back garden. I like to grow things spaced out so I can actually um, plant and dig all of these potatoes with my tractor. I grow about a thousand pounds of potatoes that last me throughout the year and I have a lot away. And they are growing really well, despite my battle with the Colorado potato beetle. I'm winning that battle, picking off a lot of them. So you can see they're just flowering now, which means the potatoes are, are starting to form underneath. And actually potato flowers are quite pretty. So you'll see these, these have a, sort of a pink purple color. Um, I have three rows of a potato, which is a purple skin potato but it is a yellowed flesh, so it has that texture and deliciousness of like a Yukon gold, <clears throat> but it has an interesting purple skin. I have two rows of a white potato. It's called Dakota Pearl. You can see the flowers are different. The plants are a little bit smaller, so you can actually distinguish the different potato plants 
uh, by the color of the leaves than the color of the flowers. And then my favorite red potatoes. So those are the potatoes. Here are my onions. Onions are growing really well this year. Red onions and uh, yellow onions. And I'll, I'll uh, let the skins on these dry once they are fully formed the bulbs and um, save them for the winter. They last a long time hung up in a uh, place that gets lots of airflow. And see we have a camper staying with us today. So they have their RV over there. Now I usually plant garlic, but I, I had a problem sourcing the garlic last year from the company. They, they didn't have enough, they sold out and I didn't get any garlic bulbs to plant. And usually that's done in the fall in October. <coughs> okay, corn. So I do grow corn, um, actually a little bit of sweet corn. So these first two rows here are sweet corn, but the rest of this is all corn that I grow for dried corn. And I make my own tortillas. So I, I grow the corn, dry the corn, grind the corn. I even bought a traditional Mexican metate to grind the corn on to make the masa dough to make tortillas. After you have to process the corn with um, uh, lime calcium hydroxide in order to nixtamalize it, and then you grind it. And so, I have um, a blue variety and a green variety from Oaxaca, and I also have taken some of the, the cobs that I have that have different interesting colors that weren't the original blue and green, and I've saved those seeds and planted them. So I actually have kind of a red colored corn because I had some cobs that were just, came out just red. So I planted those this year. And I also had some that had sort of rainbow colors or multicolored, and I have four rows of a multicolored corn. So I'm interested to see what grows from that. And it's growing really well. Corn is looking really good. Here's my winter squashes. So I have um, a spaghetti squash, I have acorn squash, and I have butternut squash. And these will just take over this whole space here. Uh, they're just starting to grow out. And um, in another month, there's going to be no soil left visible here because this will completely cover them. And for looks, I planted a row of sunflowers here. They aren't blooming yet, but they're coming up pretty nicely, just to give some color. Now, one of the things we do in winemaking is we make wine from rhubarb. And we had 150 rhubarb plants growing here at one time, and then we got a flood and they all drowned. So this year, I actually found some of those rhubarb plants, dug them up, I, I put down this landscape fabric to try to keep the weeds down because I this got so inundated with grass before without this and I replanted them and what we can see is yes it looks like they are starting to grow I mean you don't see much coming out of the holes yet but there are live um, live rhubarb plants in there and I'm hoping the rain tonight is going to wake them back up and I hope they survive because these plants grew huge. They were, I don't know, like three feet tall with stalks about uh, two inches or three inches around and leaves that were bigger than, you know, anything. That one's looking okay. But they really could use some water. It's a little dry. And this is the one part I haven't really weeded yet. You can see how thick that grass is. This grass um, infiltrated my aronia berry. These aronia berries are choke berries. A very high nutritious, high antioxidant containing berry and they're green right now, but these will turn almost red, dark, dark red, almost black when they're fully ripe. And they, they grow really well, even despite all the grass. I need to just come in and, and mow all this down. And it's past the season, but we do have asparagus as well. You can see it's gone to seed, um, but in the springtime, fresh asparagus. It never makes it into the house, so I don't have any recipes to cook with asparagus because I just eat it right from the garden. So yeah, that's my garden. You probably can hear the 
RV's generator there. So just to look out again, this is another view from of our property. This is the water channel that's all dried up right now. And as I said, we have about five acres. All of that was um, burned off, tilled up, and seeded with natural prairie grasses and flowers. And we're hoping that we can establish that prairie back. And we have trails mowed out there for people to walk through. So it's a really lovely spot. So yeah, there's my farm. If you have any questions about it, um, it's actually a very historic farm. This farmstead uh, was, I, I think, in the late 1800s. This site was part of the Bonanza Farms. If you've ever heard of Bonanza Farms, they were the largest farms in the world at the turn of the 19th and 20th century. And uh, they grew wheat to feed the world here. Usually we, are, we have a lot of uh, wet, um, like that channel floods every year, except this year, it's completely dry right now. So I don't even know what's going on with the weather. So I just uh, was reading a Facebook post from someone. I don't know exactly where they are, but they're talking about their market gardens. And they were talking about the fact that they just got six inches of rain in the last week. And I'm just saying, oh my gosh, what, why can't we have a little bit of that? They have too much, we have too little. <clears throat> okay, what else would you like to know? I gotta do some weeding, I see. I'll give you a close-up of this wheat. Here are the wheat fields. Yes, can you see Satan? All that Satan right there. <laughs> the uh, grain kernels are forming nicely, I can see on this wheat. And it looks like it's just starting to uh, begin to dry. Once this is completely golden brown, um, it's gonna look beautiful. They'll harvest it when it's absolutely dry. Now, if I can just make sure they don't spray their herbicides on my gardens, I'm happy. There's a back view of the property. Yeah, so uh, anyone else garden? I'm sorry, I haven't been able to see the chat all the time with the sun on my camera. Anyone else do gardening as well? So they can spray herbicides on their property without authorization. Of course, they don't need my authorization for that, but it is illegal for their spray to drift over onto our property. But it does happen, of course. That happens in all kinds of agricultural areas. When it does, there are steps one could take, I think, to um, file claims or get some recourse, but it's really, really hard. So what I have found to be much more or establish a good relationship with the farm manager who lives in the other uh, other house over there and he manages all of this property. And so now he will text me every time he's gonna spray something with what he's spraying, the wind directions. And so by just having a good relationship with your neighbors goes a lot, long, lot further than trying to file complaints or do anything because that doesn't really stop it. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, um, it's not the prettiest looking uh, view here, but I have some of my farm implements up against the machine shed here. Some uh, trash, as every farm has stuff sitting on it that I've got to take care of and get rid of. Now we don't have chickens. We don't want chickens. I don't think it's uh, nice to raise chickens necessarily. Um, obviously as a, a vegan and plant-based, I'm not into chickens, but we do have an old chicken coop, which is starting to fall apart and we want to do something with that. <clears throat> Another thing we have when we bought the property was this old train car. 
just sitting here in the trees. And you can see this train car, it's, it's more than 100 years old. The, the wood is starting to rot away, but the metal frame's all there. Um, at one time there was electricity in it. And so these I think were the, um, the mobile homes of the 19th century. So when they farmsteaded or homesteaded in this part of the country, um, the railroad of course is what brought people into North Dakota. And it was the railroad and the rail cars that they would park either to live in or obviously during, um, when there was electricity that was being used for people to live in. I think probably migrant workers or farm hands would come during harvest and stay in those places. <clears throat> so yeah, this is our farm. All right, any other questions you have? Anything else you wanna see? I could go this way too. Yeah, the original house, it's been added on to. I wish I could grow durian. Uh, the original house was added on to, but um, the original one was built in 1901. So it's a pretty old house. And I think this is the original outdoor plumbing for the house because, and you could tell that this was a, a house that was of some class because they had an outhouse made with stucco as the outside. And it's the same stucco, which is on the exterior of the original farmhouse. <clears throat> so we have a lawn, fire pit, we have fun out here, but it's been too hot lately. <clears throat> And this door is probably locked. I probably can't get in there. <clears throat> this is one of our spaces for our winery. I don't know if you can see in there. Yeah, it's locked. We'll be open this afternoon if anyone is around in Fargo. And there's the lovely Lisa answering your questions. <clears throat> All right. There you are, our farm. We bought this place to share, and so I'm glad you're here to share it with me. Eli. Well, yeah, believe it or not, um, they asked about animals, right? Mm -hmm. Whether we want animals. Well, we're not, I'm not, not going to eat, eat them. We do have a cat. Let me get my tripod set up here. Some goats might be good. Some goats. Uh, to eat the weeds. <clears throat> so one of the problems is... We don't actually live here full time. We have a house in Fargo also. So the, mo all this property is really the uh, made for a winery. And we bought the property with the intention of having the winery. So if I had my way, I'd live out here full time, but I got to convince her. Mm -hmm. What else? I don't know. It's your, it's your live feed. It's I'm my just, live feed. <laughs> I'm just the admin. <laughs> So um, I'm vegan, and since I do most of the cooking, she is practically vegan. But when, when I'm not looking, I think she might. She's vegan. No, she's vegan. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Coffee. Coffee. It's coffee time. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's nice. Okay. Uh, I think um, I probably kept you on long enough. This is a long stream and I don't think anyone's going to watch that long watching it back, but I appreciate you coming along with me. Any, anything else? Yeah. So beef tastes good. I grew up, of course, eating meat. I've been vegan for five years, uh, about five years. Yeah. Almost six years. And 
Uh, before that, of course, I did have a high plant diet for the most part. I was trying to cook healthy, uh, so I've been trying to eat whole unprocessed foods for a long time. But yeah, I made the switch to completely plant-based about almost six years ago. Um, so I do, of course, remember the taste of meat. So one of the one of the things that annoys me, and I keep answering this question over and over again in my comments on my Satan video, you have people who are visibly upset that I want to eat something that tastes like meat. And they keep calling me a hypocrite and everything like that. And I try to explain to them, many of us grew up eating meat. Many of us love the taste of meat. We just don't want to harm the animals or we don't want the the health effects from all those saturated fats. So, uh, you know, if it if it helps in in eating less and uh, hurting less animals, then I don't see any problem with it. But they seem to not be able to understand that it's just food. For me, I part of me thinks that we shouldn't have too many. We shouldn't label things as this is vegan or this or this. Obviously, we can talk about the goals of reducing animal harm, and we can talk about the goals of healthy eating. Um, but we start pegging things into labels and they become like really restrictive and then almost divisive. So. Yeah, so protein. Um, obviously, uh, the, other, the other main question a vegan gets is where do you get your protein? Of course, I, my answer is where did the cows get their protein from? They eat it from plants. Um, but, uh, of course, there are times when we want lean, healthy sources of protein, and I think seitan is one of that. If, if you're not intolerant to the gluten, seitan is a great, lean, uh, no saturated fats. It's, it's a really good source of protein. Ooh, did you? I don't know if they could hear that. So, out in our grassy areas, we have wild pheasants, and... I just heard one, it's a pheasant rooster making its call. Yes, yeah, so I actually, at my winery, I have uh, a food menu. I serve some sandwiches. As a matter of fact, the Bon Mi recipe I shared with you is the Bon Mi sandwich that I serve here at the winery. Uh, and people look at my menu and see that it's all plant-based and they're a little hesitant to try. I'm now doing a soy curl um, barbecue sandwich with coleslaw, and it's really delicious. And I actually had a guy from Texas the other day uh, showing up here, and he ordered that it was a little hesitantly, but he a ordered it a lot hesitantly. <laughs> yeah, you know, because those Texans, they're like, "You, that's not barbecue. You don't know what barbecue is. Mm -hmm. I, I do know what barbecue is, and I know how to make it plant-based. So He loved it. Yeah, he loved it. He ate the whole thing. Yeah, almost ordered another one, right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but it was too full. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. Sandwiches. Mm -hmm. I have sandwiches. I have um what else do we have on our menu? Uh hummus. Uh, of course I make homemade hummus. Um maybe someday from the chickpeas I can grow in my garden. That'd we'll see. Awesome. That would be nice. <clears throat> I think that would be a first in North Dakota, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Hummus. I make my own salsas, which is why I'm growing the tomatoes. I didn't show you. I have a, a, a patch of cilantro out there, too, so I can have fresh cilantro. And the jalapenos, they all go into um, the salsa that we serve here. Which is amazing. It is good. Mm -hmm. And tomatillos. I didn't <clears throat> see those. Tomatillos. Are they growing? Oh, yeah. Huge. Okay. Yeah, we're going to have more tomatillos than we know what to do with. Because I bought too many plants. And all the volunteers. Oh. I have, like, three times as many plants now. So we'll have lots of tomatillos. Anyone in the area? Are you stopping by in North Dakota? Because I know you're going to fly across the ocean here. Salsa Verde. Ah, uh, tzatziki. Yes, I've been thinking about tzatziki. And I think a good tzatziki um, needs yogurt. And my, my almond yogurt, that's why I've been experimenting with this almond yogurt and making it here. Because I, can, I think I want to use that for a couple of things. One is tzatziki. Uh, I think it would be great for tzatziki. The other is for Indian foods because Indian food, um, a lot of them are marinated. Like if you think about chicken tikka, I want to do a seitan tikka that's marinated in, in the almond yogurt. I think that would be really good. All right. So, yeah. So hopefully when the garden becomes... 
uh, producing, I'll be able to make some recipes from those foods. Oh, I want to go Cypress Creek. Where's that? Uh, I, the Greek comment side. Mississippi. Oh, Greek. I was born in Cypress Creek side. Ah, Cypress. I'm like, Cypress Creek, is that in California? <laughs> it should be. Greece is a country I haven't been to yet, and I'm dying to go. A good friend of mine who lives here uh, makes a pilgrimage to Greece every year. Um, and we have uh, a guy here. Maybe you could grab it. Mm -hmm. We have a guy in town here who um, has a relationship with a, a small oil producer, olive oil producer, over in Crete, actually. And he goes back every year, and he brings back special, um, special Greek olive oil, which I just love. I think I have it here. Yes, Mistra Estates. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Is it reversed on there? No, it is on my camera. Uh, this is this I mean, Greek I olive oil. That's just really, really delicious. Small produced and one of the best olive oils I've had. So where else are people from? Oh, we've got the UK, and oh, good. we've got the Middle East, and we've got, that's what I know. That's what I've seen. Oh, and Colfax. Colfax? Yep. I th did they log off yet? <laughs> Probably. Oh, Malaysia, yes. Oh, Malaysia, sorry. Malaysian food too is sorry. really good. Yep, yep, I, I, I agree. Iraq? No, I agree, I want uh, fried chicken chicken. I want fried. And France? Vegan. Yes, good. Vegan chicken. Oh, there's Bob and Deborah still here. Or one of them. What? Aren't you guys working? Don't you got to get ready? Are you open today? Uh, good friends of ours that also own a winery nearby. Dakota Vines Vineyard and Winery. Wonderful place. You want vegan fried chicken? Um, yeah, so seitan, I think most of my experiments with trying to fry seitan, um, well, you say it's good. The texture, I can't get the texture quite right. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, the washed flour recipe, so I, I was watching all the questions about that washed flour seitan, and I've been making it for a while, and I realized that people were trying to learn how to make it from a 30 second TikTok video, and it really doesn't explain it well because you can't see how the texture changes. And a lot of people were just giving up too soon or not knowing what to look for. So I made the video and I guess it's been pretty popular because it kind of blew up my channel. I'm glad it's helpful. But anyway, anyone have experience making fried seitan, like fried chicken? Is it better to use vital wheat gluten or is it better to use washed flour? I think most of these people have. Mm -hmm. If they're here on my channel, I'm sure That's they close. have. <laughs> we should so. do a garden tour when it's when there's oh, lots of produce. Yeah, if you want, I can I can do another garden tour later on when it's um, grown up. I and think this year's better. this year has been really. It seems to be really slow, but now it's just starting to uh, like really, really grow. So, is sausage? Yeah. So sausages. I do like sausages, and I plan to do some videos on sausages. I prefer to use the vital wheat gluten for sausages because um, the, I think the texture is better. You're not necessarily looking for a shredding texture in a sausage. So. For sausages, like a chorizo or an Italian sausage, um, I use vital wheat gluten and I mix in a lot of seasonings into the, into the dough uh, because you can mix it with the dried ingredients and you can also heavily season the wet ingredients. And uh, sausages using vital wheat gluten really comes out well. Thank you, I will. Yeah, I'll do another garden tour. Any other questions? We've been on for almost an hour. <laughs> well, thank you guys. I got to get some work done here and get some food prep for our opening today at the winery. And uh, so I appreciate all of you guys coming here and watching. Thanks for hanging out with the tour. It's been great. We'll see you next time. Uh, live cooking. So yes, I plan to do that 
what I need to figure out is where and how to do it because I don't have the best kitchen set up to have the cameras in the right position to actually look at me. So you'll see in my videos, I'm focused in on the food and then I, I do the videos of me explaining things and overlay them, but I don't have a place that easily shows like a full live cooking, but as soon as I can figure that out, we'll definitely do some live cooking. Anyway, thanks. Thanks so much. We'll see you.